Welcome to devmode.fm, a podcast dedicated to the tools, techniques, and technologies used in modern web development. I'm Andrew Welch from NY Studio 107, and today we have on the podcast Chris Ferdinandi, the vanilla JS guy from gomakethings.com. Chris, welcome. Thanks. It's uh, it's really great to be here. Yeah, and we wanted to have you on because we wanted to, you you mentioned in, in passing, we had a conversation on Twitter about how our modern best practices are harming the web. And so I wanted to talk to you. You sounded like you had some interesting ideas that uh, maybe we should discuss. So if you were walking down a beach in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea, and you had just put in the, the betel nut along with the mustard stick and the lime, and you were chewing it in your mouth, and the guy next to you said, hey, Chris, you know... The state of web development is crazy. What, what do you think is wrong with it? What would you say? <laughs> I'd say, hey, that's a really weird way to start a conversation on a tropical island. But, well, you, um, well, you got to do it quickly because I don't know if you ever had betel nut, but it, it gives you one heck of a buzz. So you probably got like 30 to 60 seconds before you're going to pass out. All right. Yeah. So I've got, um, <clears throat> so I've gotten uh, like just a short amount of time to talk about this then. Well, just um, a summary yeah, so, of, of what you, what yeah. the major things you think are wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No. So for me, the big issues with the way we build for the web today are that we we prioritize the experience of building things as developers mm. over the experience for the user. <laughs> and in my opinion, we also prioritize the experience for a very tiny subset of developers and not the development community as a whole. So we love to talk about the developer experience, but these things that quote unquote, make the developer experience better, really only do so, in my opinion, for a very small slice of developers mm. and exclude in the process a large chunk of the community. That's really um, funny because we've got a, a host on here named Earl. And and that is one of his big complaints is that he's like, I'm, I'm glad that this makes it better for you, developer. Mm -hmm. But how does it make it better for the, the person who's browsing the site? You know? Yeah, yeah. It's um I've been giving a talk on this topic for a little while now, and um I sometimes feel like the alt title for it should be Old Man Yells at Cloud. Um because <laughs> I, I, I I I I sometimes feel and I hate to use Simpsons references because I'm not really a big fan, but I sometimes feel like the whole like, you know, am I really old and out of touch? No, it's the kids who are wrong. Like I just <laughs> I feel like I'm missing something. But I just I so often don't see how what we do today makes things better. And like, I don't mean to just kind of throw away the whole kit and caboodle here. Like a lot of the things we do today were built to solve real problems that developers face. Sure. And within a very narrow kind of use case, I think they sometimes can be effective at solving that problem. But we've started to apply these really kind of narrow intent tools to a wide array of things that they were never really built for. And, um, I just, for lack of a more eloquent term, I think it's just, it's bad. Um, I think the web is a bloated mess today. And I have some ideas on how we can fix it. Well, let's get into some specifics because, I mean, web performance is a big part of what I'm concerned with. Mm -hmm. And a decent amount of the work that I, I get called in to do is I do performance audits and I do a whole bunch of stuff to make the web performance better. And that is something that is done primarily for conversion purposes, right? Because Google has found that people don't like websites that are slow and horrible. And that is something that it's interesting because that actually yeah, is then... absolutely. Yeah, then that is something that is actually enhancing the user experience. Because when a, a website loads quickly, like, it's kind of nice, you know? You feel like you're in control. You feel like you're in... in you've got the power. You tap something and it happens. So I, I'm definitely on board with you from myself. the... But let, let's get into specifics. Like, what what are we doing wrong? Like, give me, let's start just one thing at a time. And let's start, why don't we start with JavaScript frameworks, maybe, because you're the vanilla JS guy. What's wrong yeah. with, with, with using React or Vue or Svelte or, you know, Stencil or whatever else it is that we want to use? It's funny you start there. I have like about five things I usually run through. Uh -huh. And that is, that is kind of my starting point. There you um, go. <laughs> is the, the framework, all the things. It makes sense because it's kind of like the big, the big best practice these days. So the... When I talk about these things, I usually like to talk about the appeal of them first, because I, I think it's important to kind of understand the context in which they make sense. And right. so I think from what, what I gather, there's a few big draws. And even having played with them myself, like one of the biggest draws is around state-based user interfaces. So mm. if you're building an app that needs to change frequently, being able to say, based on the data, here's how this thing should look. And then whenever the data changes, 
the user interface just magically updates and you don't have to like figure out what to target and how to manipulate things. That's really cool. And I totally understand why that's appealing. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. The uh, It's like, it's just a really, really smart way to handle things. One of the other big things I often hear thrown out when people talk about using React and Vue and Angular is, you know, like, you know, JavaScript at scale. And, you know, when you're working with large data sets, it's more performant to use uh, virtual DOM instead of the real DOM because the real DOM is so slow and yada, yada, yada. And that's that's valid, too, for like really, really large data sets. Virtual DOM can be faster. And then, of course, there's also the whole like fewer bugs argument where these tools are used by thousands of developers at hundreds of thousands of companies. So there's constant testing and bug fixing and all sorts of awesome resilience happening. So, you know, whenever I talk about this, there's, you know, kind of these nods of like, oh, yeah, that, that sounds awesome. Like, what's not to like about that? But, um, you know, one of the big arguments for using these things is performance. And in my opinion, kind of the the setup here is these frameworks also cause a lot of performance problems. So the scale thing, for example, we talk about performance at scale all the time with frameworks. Okay, first of and, all, you've triggered me because at, yeah, well, at yeah. scale is like the new buzzword that everyone's yeah, using. Yeah, it, and it's, you know, so like the companies <laughs> that built these tools, right? Facebook, Twitter, yeah. the companies that use these tools on a regular basis, they, they deal with legitimate, like, performance crippling scale. Right. Most of the people who are using these tools are working at a level of scale with their data sets, kind of the just the overall code base that these tools were not built for them. Yeah. I, I don't know how like a better way to say this, but like the types of scale these tools were designed to deal with does not apply to 99% of the developers who use them. Yeah, um, like an example we use here is uh, Billy D. Joe Bob. He's got a Buffalo Hide Tannery website. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like he's not dealing with scale issues. You know right. what I mean? He's lucky. I, I would love to have those scale problems, but I don't, <laughs> right. you know, most right. of us never will. Right. But but our yeah. frameworks, one of the, okay, so we had on Rich Harris who did uh, the Svelte framework. And one which of I the, love. Yeah, which is really cool. And, and one of the things that he mentioned mm -hmm. in his talk is that the frameworks are more for organizing your mind and not your code. And mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty interesting. So one of the things that I found that frameworks are useful for mm -hmm. is if you start out where you're just doing like a little bit of JavaScript, you're doing a little bit of jQuery, and then things get more and more complex, you end up just like tacking it together. And I know it doesn't have to be this way, right? But a lot of times it ends up that you end up with this like spaghetti code. Yes. And the, the thing that the frameworks do is they say, OK, no, you're going to do it this way. And if you want to if you want data that changes, you do it this way. So they're kind of giving you best practices that you can then nestle your code into. You don't think I that's that's good. Suppose the the flip side is one of the one of the things I see come up a lot, especially with beginners, is for any singular thing you might want to do with React or Vue or Angular or any other framework, there's usually not the one way to do things. Oh, there's yeah, multiple especially, ways to approach stuff. Yeah, that's true. And so it's really easy to be like, well, you know, they force structure. And to an extent they do. There's like a loose kind of structuring that happens. Right. But you still have a whole bunch of decisions you have to make. There's potentially fewer of them. And there's probably value in that. But the idea that structure is just handled for you when you use these, I think is a convenient talking point that doesn't necessarily hold up with reality. I, would, I, I would, looked at a bunch of different... I would say that there is there is some structure, but I think the biggest thing, it, maybe structure isn't the right word, maybe more methodologies or such. Like I, I kind of yeah. liken it to naming conventions. So if you're sure. if you're dealing with a number of, of programmers, you need to settle on some naming conventions, right? If you don't, it ends up being just a complete mess. Now, which naming convention should you be using? Well, it really doesn't matter, right? I mean, the thing that matters here is that you decide on one. OK, because right. the value is in agreeing on it. And I, I guess that one thing that the frameworks do provide is this is the way that you would you should do it. But you're right, especially with React, like <laughs> React is pretty lightweight. So if you want to do stuff with, you know, routing or state or X, Y or Z, there are like a whole bunch of different ways that you could do it. Yeah. And um, I don't know. That also feels to me. I don't want to trivialize it because that that is the the structure is important. Important. Mm -hmm. But it also feels like the kind of thing like where most projects fall into spaghetti go code mess is when you don't have an opinionated lead or decision maker who ultimately says like, oh, yeah, yes, this, no, that. And when we try and argue for 
frameworks in the context of they they force structure. It feels like you're abdicating the need for a strong technical lead who does that. It's almost like you're yeah. you're leaning on a technical solution for what's really a people problem. And you kind of are. I mean, in some ways you're saying, well, those smart people at Facebook probably made some good decisions about the way things should be done. So they're kind of doing that for you. I, I get your point that it's yeah. not a substitute for actually having a strong lead. But, you know, when you've got the, the freelancer who's working in his basement somewhere, mm-hmm. you know, he doesn't have necessarily or she doesn't necessarily yeah. have a, a technical lead, you know, they're, then so maybe maybe some of that structure is, is helpful. Yeah, the problem with the that's an interesting argument. I'm not sure the spaghetti code problem, like it's more of a danger with teams where people don't like different developers don't do things consistently. I suppose a an inexperienced developer could do things differently in multiple parts of their code base. Oh my God. The but, things, listen, Chris, the <laughs> things that I have seen, like, <laughs> oh, not, sure. No, I, like, I mean, you know, same, but like, I've been onboarded in various projects and the things that I've seen, I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> but I mean, you can have that in a framework project too. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Like, and there's like these tools don't fix those things. They just give you a little, they give you some rails. Right. Um, well, Ruby on uh, rails was popular for rails, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was part of the name. No, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I think that there are some benefits to using frameworks, but the real question is, no what question. are what are the downsides, right? Mm-hmm. And do the downsides outweigh the benefits? And you know, like you're saying, for for many projects, maybe they do. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Um, well, no, so I, I'm saying I'm saying that the yeah. the benefit of using a framework is not there oh, ba- oh, based on the. Sorry, I'm, totally, I'm I'm totally arguing your good. your stance. Okay. Good, good. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. The caffeine's starting to wear off. That's okay. Um, you know, the other thing, like people talk about the bug fix thing all the time and like, mm. you know, like that's all solved for you. But uh, like if you ever look at the issues on like frameworks, a lot of times the the bug fixes that you're inheriting and the features that you're picking up are for bugs that you'll never have, for weird edge cases you'll never encounter, for features you never need. You're, you're picking up a whole bunch of code that's just irrelevant to you. And it's easy to be like, well, you know, so what? But yeah, you, you probably... I'm sure you're familiar with this because of your work doing performance consulting, but because of how browsers work, JavaScript has such a bigger tax on performance than HTML and right. CSS do. Yeah. Um, Adi Osmani wrote a really awesome article about this last year on Medium, the cost of JavaScript. Yeah, where, it's a good one. Um, you know, he talks about how byte for byte JavaScript is still the most expensive resource we we send down the line because of how it delays interactivity. I don't know if you remember the one less JPEG movement from like a couple years ago where people were like, well, you know, rather than worrying about that 300 kilobytes of JavaScript, just use one less JPEG, get rid of that hero image and you're done. But you know, JavaScript is just so much more demanding to parse and execute. It blocks the page from rendering, blocks files from downloading. You don't have to, you know. (laughs) You can't just run it when you get it. There's all this stuff that needs to happen before. You're not executing a JPEG, you're decoding it. And, and and it's not even the typically there are hardware accelerated bits of the computer yeah. or device that take care of that for you. So, mm-hmm. I, I mean, from a page weight point of view, I get that. But from a actual performance point of view, that, that just doesn't add up at all. It doesn't make no, any sense. No, yeah, it's, it may save someone a few bytes on their data plan. But like in terms of actual experience using your site or app. Yeah, it's not. I would love to have someone on this program that would try to tell me to do that because I would, <laughs> I would, I would tear them apart. I mean, what do you mean? Use one less JPEG? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> so, so this brings us to another modern best practice, which is package managers and mm. module bundlers. So, because we have all these large JavaScript bundles now that create performance problems, we start using package managers and module bundlers like Bower and Yard and Webpack and Parcel and Rollup. And I really like. I one thing I'm really impressed with with these tools is the naming. People are really good at coming up with weird names for their JavaScript tools. Mm. I'm, um, I'm way more obvious with my stuff. It's never that, never that interesting. So these tools handle dependency management. They figure out what JS files to include on a given page um, rather than loading everything everywhere. And the newer ones, you know, they do this cool thing called tree shaking, where if you have a file that should be there, but it has code that doesn't need to be, they, they shake that out too. Right. This isn't a terrible idea, but the trade-off for this approach is that there's, there's a much higher setup and maintenance cost than you would have had historically in the just use a script tag or script element and load your thing on the page. We have this like crazy dependency tree situation going on now where, um, have you ever been in a job where you spend the first two weeks just trying to get your 
computer setup and fighting through like really bad documentation and terminal errors and debugging because it works on your coworker's computer but not yours like I mean, this sounds sucked. like a this sounds like a day in the life here to be honest with right? you right like you just you <laughs> like i got into this industry because i i like making things as right. my website name implies and not because i want to spend days in terminal trying to figure out why my build doesn't work it's just a really demotivating way to work and if anybody's ever tried to run like npm install or run a build process and one of their dependencies has gotten out of date somewhere in the chain not even like files you've immediately included but like their dependencies and stuff the whole thing comes crashing down around you like a like a house of cards it's just this incredibly fragile kind of experience and i've started squirreling away tweets from like well-known people complaining about how these tools that are supposed to save them time have cost them hours and hours <laughs> of their day. So you've right. got folks like Kyle Shevlin and Brad Frost, you know, complaining about like stuff that would have taken them 10 minutes the old fashioned way has brought them down this like multi-hour rabbit hole of trying to figure out these weird kind of setup issues. Yeah. And, and we had, um, we had uh, Fred Schott from the Pika project on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're trying to address some of the things that you're talking about with package managers where, look, I just like I want to use the script from this package, but I don't want to deal with the whole setup process. Yep. Just let me throw a script tag in there that will then load it and then away we go. But I want to play the, the devil's ad advocate with you on here, which is that Please do. the reason why we're using things like NPM mm -hmm. is we have found the benefit of leveraging other people's work yep. in that. You know, there are all these packages out there. We want to be able to leverage them and use them and pull them in. Now, I, I definitely agree with you that it is a little bit out of control from, from the point of view of people are using a lot of times hundreds, maybe even thousands of packages that they have no idea, you know, how secure they are or are not. And they, they don't even know, like on, on the average website build, if I were to ask someone, you know, what project, what packages are installed on there, they might not even know. And I'm not talking about the direct dependencies. I'm talking about all of the uh, various sub dependencies that are in there. Like I open up my node modules uh, folder mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh my God, what is all this crap that's in here? But guilty. But what is the benefit, right? So the benefit is that we get to leverage everyone's code. And this kind of leans on the, the former discussion, which is that, okay, we want to use this JavaScript framework. And then because we're using this JavaScript framework, maybe we want to, to use a package for it that does routing. And then maybe we want to use a prefab component for it. And the idea is that we're building on the shoulders of giants, and then we can just grab these pieces, chunk them together, and we'll be ahead of the game. How is that wrong? It's not. The problem is the building blocks we choose in the first place. Mm. So frameworks aren't inherently bad. I think the ones we lean on, we kind of have this obsession with features, right? So we use something like Vue or React because it has a ton of stuff baked in. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff you never need. A tool like Svelte or Hyper HTML does a lot of the same stuff, uses a lot of the same conventions, either is or compiles to a fraction of the size. Even something right. like Preact versus React right. is, you know, a fraction of the size gives you a similar kind of experience, much better for the end user, much less overall complexity. Like the for me, the the problem isn't the the idea of using modules and open source projects. I love them. I use them all the time myself. It's that we tend to choose the big full featured ones for just the one or two things in them. It's like when you see jQuery loaded to select an element by class or ID, where right. the browser just gives you that for free now. Right, um, right. And that's the only thing that the jQuery is on the site for, it's just the selector engine. Like, Oh, sure. You know, it's... um. Well, even worse, you know, like the, I, I, I will build something with, um, you know, a modern framework like Vue, mm -hmm. and then maybe there's one package somewhere that I need for something, and then it's got a dependency on jQuery. <laughs> Right? And maybe it's yeah. an old version of jQuery. And then I'm, you know, then I'm loading that in. I actually ran into this recently with a, a token field. And I'm like, this is insane. Like I'm using Vue for everything. And, and then this is pulling in jQuery just for this dumb little token field thing. And then it ends up being that the version of jQuery that it's pulling in, thanks to NPN audit, it tell, tells me that it's it has a vulnerability. I'm like, are you kidding me? This this dumb little uh, <laughs> probably will never be updated token field thing that I'm using has got a security vulnerability and it's loading jQuery when I'm already using Vue. Like it just it feels gross. Yeah, yeah. And so I I'm, I guess my argument here is if you choose tools more wisely. So if you if you think about this in terms of like a like a Legos approach 
rather than a just kind of the whole thing is pre-built for you kind of approach. I don't have a good like toy analogy for that one. You potentially don't need the module loaders because you're not trying to extract small things from larger tools. Like Mm -hmm. I would love if as a community, we started building smaller, more focused tools. Like I need a fork. I don't need an eight tool utility knife most of the time that includes a fork, a knife, a can opener, a whole, you know, like just pick the tools that have just the things you need and nothing else. But those are hard to find. There's not as many of them out there as I'd like, and they tend to not be as well known, which is too bad. Well, that's what's Um, super appealing about Svelte though, right? Is that with Svelte, you have a wide range of capabilities available to you, but when it actually goes to build the thing, it only builds what you're actually using. You don't get the whole framework, right? Which in theory allows that framework to be way broader in terms of the functionality that it offers because there's no cost. If you don't use something that it offers, that's fine. It's not even part of your your final build. Yeah, I I really like, I haven't worked with it directly on a project yet, Mm -hmm. but I've dug through the documentation a whole bunch and I recommend Svelte to folks as an alternative to some of these other tools. Now be careful about recommending it if you've never used it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's no, and that's that's fair. It's for me. It's um, it's it, it represents, I think, a a a better approach to yeah yeah. You see, web, you I see, think, Rich like Harris as a kindred spirit, right? In, in yes. that the things that you find important, he also finds important as, and then is addressing in that framework. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not out there going like, oh, you need, everybody needs to use Felt. But, you know, when someone says they want to use Reactor View, I say you may also want to check out. Right. You know, go see if it meets your needs. Well, um, I, think, I think part of this may also just kind of be mm-hmm. marketplace driven, right? Yeah. Like if I had someone that was a friend of mine and they said, well, you know, I'm interested in getting involved in web development. What should I learn? If I look at the marketplace in terms of where they're going to get a decent paying job, I would probably be wrong to tell them, you know, I, like I should be telling them, learn React or learn Vue, you know? Uh, I know. I started compiling I know. a list of employers who um, who do things in a um, more vanilla kind of way. Mm-hmm. There's not a ton of them. It's um, it's 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 honestly kind of tough to uh, tough to find because people don't really when they're not using these tools, they don't tend to get written up in case studies a lot. Or and and by the way, I'm not saying that you're wrong in saying that because you know if I also looked at the landscape and I said, well, what's the most prevalent uh, restaurant in the country it would be McDonald's. Does that mean that I think that that's the best place to go eat? No. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but you know, you know what I mean? Just because something yeah. is popular doesn't mean that it's awesome or the best way to do things. And Mm-mm. if we know anything about the web, it's that best practices is a moving target. <laughs> right? And who knows? Maybe, maybe we will look back at this in in 10 years and we'll be like how what were we thinking like how did we ever get anything done with the mess that was there you know i mean it it reminds me of that um there was an article on uh how how it feels to learn javascript in 2016 yep and it's relevant still holds up it's still totally true and it's and it's hilarious but one of the things that i want to kind of broach with this is that Originally, web development was kind of like HTML, CSS, a little bit of JavaScript sprinkled in to, you know, animate something or whatever. And then that was that, right? Now that we've got things like fat clients and frameworks that run in a browser and we're building stuff that it really is web app-ish, aren't we naturally just trying to do something that is more complex and sometimes complicated things are complex in terms of the tooling you need? Yes, maybe. Maybe. All right. So that... That has become a convenient ex- – I'm not saying you're wrong because you're not. Sometimes certain web apps are sufficiently complicated that they do need a more complex tool chain. But that also gets used rather like as a kind of a convenient catch-all to dismiss 15, 20 years of kind of best practice learning around certain things. Oh, like, yeah. I don't need progressive enhancement because this is an app. It's not a website. Right. It's an app. Right. You know, or I absolutely need this framework because I'm building an app. And it's like, well, you know, there's there's a lot of apps you can build with like really not that much vanilla JavaScript. I do it all the time. There are certainly things that require a lot more and that are more complex. Um, Oh, but it's gotten crazy. Like people are not just building web apps. Like there'll be like a marketing brochure site and it'll be, you know what I mean? They'll be using all sorts of crazy stuff. 
I saw a news site not too long ago that was using, like, I think React kind of, and they were bragging about, like, you know, because of the lazy loading of the mm -hmm. articles with API driven, yada, yada, mm -hmm. it was so much faster for this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, you know, if you guys just drop, like, I don't know, maybe like 12 of the 15 trackers you load on your page, you could probably oh. get the same results doing it the old fashioned way. Um, yeah. Well, that that's, that's another topic, right? Because every news site under the sun is like... <sighs> I mean, it's just crawling with, you know, yeah, just garbage. Yeah. And, but that, that's a whole nother story, right? I mean, that's like a, that's probably a side discussion in terms of the uh, best practices, because that is really just horrible things that marketers are doing <laughs> on the web. One thing, one thing I feel like we really need to talk about yeah. on this topic, and yeah. I don't necessarily care when, but is, um, is gatekeeping. Let's, and let's what do a it. lot of these best practices do. Yeah. So yep. it, just if anybody's listening and they're not familiar, gatekeeping is is kind of the process of excluding either intentionally or not people from a particular process. So really controlling who who has enough expertise to actually use your thing. And so one of the one of the consequences of moving from a more HTML and CSS driven development process to one that's more JavaScript driven is you exclude people without JavaScript experience from the process and right. you know there's plenty of people who either have like deep specialized css expertise or they do other things that are important like accessibility audits or um you know the user experience professionals who also can kind of write a little bit of code and when everything requires javascript especially as you start to see sites where even the css is built in javascript which mm -hmm. is another rant for another day or maybe a rant for today depending on how yeah we had goes. we had the guys um, from emotion on the on the, uh, the podcast to talk about that too, but yeah, keep going you know, about the it, um, the gatekeeper. Yeah, it just, you know, it it just inherently excludes people from the process. Like, so right. Alex Russell is a um, developer on the Chrome team, and last year he wrote this really great article called "The Developer Bait and Switch," where he talks about this straw man argument that he ha has with people all the time around using frameworks, and it goes something like this: These tools let us move faster, and because we can iterate faster, we're developing better experiences. And we talked about this at the beginning, but like that is almost certainly true for people who have a certain level of comfort with Java script and decidedly not for people who don't. So last year, accessibility consultant Rian Reitveld resigned from her position on the WordPress accessibility team, right. where she was the team lead. And uh, you, you've probably already seen this, but she documented it in a really detailed article. The, um, the TLDR on this was that Gutenberg, the new WordPress editor, is built with React. And because of that, and because no one on her team has React experience, and they couldn't find any volunteers in the accessibility community who did either, they couldn't effectively work on accessibility improvements themselves. It made her ability and her team's ability to do the job they were tasked with doing really, really difficult. And in May of this year, there was a detailed accessibility audit of this new editor that resulted in 329 detailed pages of accessibility issues. The executive summary alone was 34 pages, and they found 91 accessibility related related bugs, ju just accessibility bugs. So not like bigger picture bugs with the code, just like accessibility things that Rian's team could have fixed if she and her people weren't gatekeeped out, gate kept, gatekeeped, I don't know, whatever the, the thing is for that, <laughs> gate kept out of the process because of the tool selection. Right. Um, you know, I'm sure for the developers cranking away at this stuff, great, we can look at how, look at how much we can do so quickly, but so much gets missed along the way. Um, and if you really care about building things for everyone, and if you don't, you're a jerk, then, and I, I really mean that, um, <laughs> then, you know, like, not that you shouldn't use these tools, but you need to be a little bit more mindful about if you use them, how you use them. Right. Um, and, and from talking to people that, you know, built the tools, right? So the, the emotion guys, mm -hmm. they're, they're not building these to like exclude anyone and they're not being like ha ha you can't do this now it's more just that you know they they have bought into the culture of using the javascript framework they prefer to use react and it's easier and nicer for them to do all of their css inside of uh, js so i, I you know? absolutely never hate on the people who build these tools. I mean, I guess right. sometimes do not intentionally, but like, I don't believe anybody builds these tools with bad intentions in mind. I think they're always built to solve a very specific problem that a specific person or team or organization has within a very specific context. Right. And then as our community does, they open source stuff. So others who have those same problems can benefit from right. it. Um, it seems like we often kind of latch onto these things turn them into new best practices and expand them into a whole ton of use cases they were never really designed for, though. Well, that's um, true, man, because, you know, it, it's an old saw, but um, the right tool for the job, 
right? And if, yes, yeah. you can have, you can own just a hammer and use that for everything, but you're going to make a mess out of stuff that you're building, right? So like for Facebook and the app that they have and the team they have to build it, mm. React probably makes sense. And, you know, for the emotion guys um, and kind of their workflow and their team, CSS and JS probably makes sense. I sometimes question whether the drawbacks of certain techniques outweigh the benefits and things like that. But, right. um, you know, my my bigger issue is not that these tools exist. It's that they've morphed into best practices that everyone is just expected to do, whether right. it makes sense for the project and the team or not. It's just what people do now. That's the really that's the thing that I think really. Uh, well, that that almost makes me think it gets back to what you were mentioning before about not having a strong lead. If mm -hmm. you don't have a CTO ish person or a strong technical lead that is helping to make the decisions, not, you know, I know you guys love React, but um, we're building a brochure site, so we're not using it for this, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's almost like that piece is then missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I worked on a pretty big project recently where the team wanted to, um, they wanted to use Angular because it's just what they were familiar with and right. what they've done past and angular is as everybody knows the worst of the framework no i'm just kidding it is it is definitely the largest it has you know the the, the kilobyte footprint on it is definitely the largest right of, of all much and the the project was such that you know there was the intent was that we we weren't just kind of going to be handing templates that get rendered out. This was a tool that was going to be picked up by others who could then pass in their own kind of templates and customizations and things like that. And they kept presenting arguments as to why this had to be done in Angular because X, Y, Z, you know, like, well, string concatenation for creating templates is really annoying. And, you know, like we can't do modular, you know, we, we like to have modular files and blah, blah, blah. So I literally, I spent like, like three hours one afternoon whipping together a vanilla JavaScript demo that would do the same thing with like template literals and a lightweight, like gulp build tool. Right. And, you know, I, I showed it to them. I'm like, here's how it works. Take it for a test drive over the weekend. Tell me what you think. The like the finished code base was smaller than just including Angular or Vue alone would have been, and that's before you start dropping in all of the like templates and stuff on top of it. And uh, you know they came back and they're like, oh yeah, this kind of makes sense. And I think that's maybe the thing too. Like I encounter a lot of people who operate under the impression that certain things are much harder without these tools, and legitimately sometimes they are. Right. But oftentimes they're not, and people just haven't been shown that they're not. Like with modern JavaScript tools, even some that are supported back, you know, as far as like IE 11 or IE, even IE 9 sometimes, like mo modern JavaScript is really capable and you can do a lot of really amazing things just with what the browser gives you out of the box. So, well, let me, yeah. let me, I'm going to play, I'm going to tell you what I do sure. and, and you can tell me, you know, how, how maybe, maybe I'm doing it wrong or maybe there are certain things that, um, I, I am using tools that I don't need to use. So sure. I, on most of the projects that I uh, work on, I am using Vue on a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And I find that it works really, really nicely because I'm working more and more with a, a headless CMS system where you really, you need to be uh, really in, in the MVC style of stuff. Now the, the Vue has moved into the front end framework, right? And it's requesting the data from the, the back end and that's all coming in. And I've just found that Vue is, is pretty fantastic fantastic in terms of building interactive user uh, interfaces where mm -hmm. I don't have to deal with, uh, and this is an argument that you mentioned before that everyone brings up, but in a, a complica uh, complicated UI like a faceted search or, or whatever, it just makes it so much easier to organize everything and to have everything be reactive so that when things change, the user immediately sees the, the changes in the front end. And I also am using Webpack as a build tool. And I did a, uh, a really big in-depth article on uh, Webpack 4. And the reason why I'm using it is that it does make some, in the end, it does make some things easier. And, and this is like a, uh, a slippery slope kind of thing. So were I not using a front end framework and a lot of these other things that come along with it, probably I wouldn't need or use Webpack. But because I am, having Webpack there is really nice because it lets me build stuff using, and uh, I can throw Babel into the mix mm -hmm. so that I can automatically get something that will be transpiled down and will work on old browsers. And then I can also do a modern 
modern build for browsers that support it. I can use the, the script type equals module to load the right thing and, you know, kind of away we go on there. And the other thing that I really enjoy about Webpack, and this is something that I'm guilty of, this is developer experience, but the, the hot module reloading, when I'm working in local dev, the fact that it will compile just what changed in the JavaScript components or mm -hmm. just what changed in the CSS and instantly apply it without having to do anything, that does make me more productive. Do you... um? So you're not loading Webpack in the browser. This is like a, a pre like a precompiler for you, right? Or like a, a build tool before shipping? So it's both. So I, I'm running Webpack dev server when I'm actually building something, you know, in local development. And then when it comes time to to build a, a production build, um, then I will run the uh, the Webpack production build and it will spit out all of the, the chunks and async load the, the pieces that it needs to async load and all that good stuff. Okay. Interesting. But I, but I, okay, so I know I'm doing all this stuff, right? And I yep. get it, right? I come from an app development background, so I'm not scared by any of this stuff. But I totally get that for a, for a huge chunk of the sites that are out there, they don't need the stuff that I'm doing. Like, I get that, you know? Mm -hmm. I totally get that. So I'm going to start this off by saying that of the big three, yep. Angular, React, Vue, I think Vue is the personally i think the best of the bunch in terms of its footprint its performance impact the fact that you can just load it on a page with a script element if you want and go right i i can't really tell you you're doing things wrong or you should do things differently because i think everybody's kind of tool chain and setup is differently i know i would probably handle things a little bit differently depending on what the app is or what it's trying to do right um, i think for like really really interactive really reactive kind of stuff there's an argument to be made that using a tool like like view makes sense i would probably explore using like something like hyper html or i kind of just to learn a little bit more about how kind of reactivity works i built my own little thing that's I think it comes out to like three kilobytes after being minified and gzipped that also does kind of reactive DOM updates. And I personally, just because I built it and I know what's in it, I would probably use that. But right. that's not to say that you should or someone else should. It's just, you know, it's the tool I use because it's it's small and I, I know how it works. But yeah, I think the thing that always gives me pause is when you're dynamically loading all of the things in the browser using Webpack. Like, so if, if Webpack itself has to get shipped down to the browser to run, if it's ha happening on a server, like on like a node server somewhere or something, for me, that's less of a concern. Like, I don't mind these tools as server-side templating things. Right. Well, uh, okay, so what actually... I'll tell you what actually gets shipped when when you build something with Webpack. There is a, a, a very small Webpack runtime that okay. ends up being typically it's part of the entry point JavaScript. And it is small. Like when I say small, it's under one kilobyte. Like it's very small. And it's part of the, the entry point JavaScript that ends up getting built. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. Like uh, that's really there's no there's no big framework or anything like that that comes along with it. And what that what that runtime is really there for is normalizing things because there are lots of different ways that you can do imports. And the other nice thing is that even though there is a module spec in, in brow modern browsers, there is no module loader spec, right? So that's what this runtime is doing for you is allowing you to dynamic and, and not everyone can need or, or should dynamically load this stuff. But as you start building things that are bigger and bigger with more and more frameworks, then you really do want to be uh, async loading just the bits that are needed. So as an example, uh, let's say there's a, a button that brings up a particular modal UI that isn't used that frequently. Mm -hmm. Using Webpack, you can have that bundle of code that is needed for loading that modal only gets actually loaded when they actually click on the button, <laughs> right? And it saves you from having to download a massive amount to get up and running because I, as I mentioned earlier, I am very speed conscious. I am very performance conscious. So I, and I definitely do understand and recognize that minimizing the amount of JavaScript that gets executed is super, super important. And that's one thing that th this kind of tooling does make easier to do is to split it out into little chunks so that you're only loading what is actually needed. Yeah. I tend to do something similar with them. Um, uh, so there's this really tiny, awesome helper function from uh, the filament group called load JS. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. That just asynchronously loads JavaScript files. Yep. And just because I don't want to deal with the complexity of Webpack, I tend to do things like, you know, down in the footer, I will have some conditionals that that say if 
you know, specific element happens to be on. So let's, let's say it's like a, an Ajax driven search kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a search form on this page, load the search JS file using load JS. And yeah, so I, I don't necessarily disagree with the approach. And if you found tools that work for you and have a minimal experience on the user, I, I think that's okay. Well, um, I, I used to use Load.js, right? So I was using Load.js, and I and I still use a variant of their Load CSS. Mm -hmm. And he actually, uh, Scott Gell, I think it is. Yeah, they just updated it. Yeah, he just updated it to use like <laughs> kind of a quirk of the way that browsers work in terms of you change the, the type of the media to print and it will, anyway, I mean, whatever. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, yeah it, it's, just, it's kind of funny. But no, so I used to use Load.js for the same things that you're talking about. Where that ended up breaking down for me is that it doesn't do any kind of dependency management, right? So let's say I've got a chunk of code that I, I want to load asynchronously, but it depends on jQuery, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then I have to make sure that jQuery is loaded before that thing is loaded. And then what if there's another thing that also has a dependency? Then you, you have to start getting these things loaded in the right order. And that is the one of the other things that tools like Webpack will, will do for you is they will do dependency management and they will make sure that when you're dynamically loading this thing, this bundle that it depends on will get loaded as well as any other, any other thing that it depends on will get loaded. I feel like in this describing the the problem it solves you're also describing the problem in general yes <laughs> which is the dependency chain yeah um and my argument continues to be and i understand this maybe doesn't work for everybody or not everybody will agree with me but i just i i think we i i prefer tools that have no dependencies and i right. feel like we have too much of a this is so corny. Too much of a dependency on dependencies <laughs> in our process. Like there's just we're too dependent on dependencies. I like it. Yeah, there's just too much <laughs> going on. Right. Like yeah, like you know, well this thing uses Lodash, so we got to load Lodash before we load this thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not trying to pick on Lodash because Lodash has a lot of awesome stuff in it, and they have a tool you can use to extract just the things you need. So that's right. Great. Right. But yeah, it just it just all feels like too much to me. Right. Like so much of the things we're doing with these tools we could do without. So many of the tools we choose have dependencies on other tools, which have dependencies on other tools. And it just it well, here, feels a little like I, madness. I, I get it. Like, I, I totally get it. Because some, some of these things are a little bit crazy. And I think that what we're talking about before in terms of it depends on what you're building, because I do think there are there are use cases where some of the stuff totally makes sense. You know, and it totally makes sense that you're going to use this kind of tooling, this kind of complexity. However, as you mentioned, there's a real danger in that that doesn't mean that every website that we need build needs to use all this stuff, right? It just doesn't make any sense that that, that, that would be the case. So don't, I, I think you nailed it before when you're saying, okay, I get it that Facebook, you need something like React in order to do stuff, quote unquote, at scale. But that doesn't mean the average person should pick that up as a best practice, right? It depends on what you're doing. And one of the kind of funny things from my perspective is that you look at what's going on with uh, the Jamstack stuff. And, and again, don't get me wrong. I love a lot of the um, advantages of using Jamstack type stuff where there's a fat client and you're, you're doing everything in your browser. But it's funny because so originally... A lot of people knew JavaScript and they said, hey, we know JavaScript, so let's get it running on our server, right? And when I first saw Node.js, I'm like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> like, I can't believe we're running JavaScript on my server, right? And then to manage that, they came up with NPM, right? And then web developers said, hey, that's a really cool thing that, you know, organizes all these packages. I want to use that on the front end. Well, before we can use that on the front end, we need a tool that can transpile it so that it will load in a browser, right? And then if we have this stuff that loads in a browser, well, then we got to manage the dependencies. And then, and then we got everything loading and running in our front end fat client. And then we realize the performance is absolutely terrible on a mobile device. <laughs> so we've got this, this mobile phone. We got everything. You know, we get this whole tool chain that built everything. We got this fantastic framework that everything is using, but it sucks on our mobile phone. Right. So then <laughs> then the solution is, OK, let's go back and let's render this stuff on the server. Right. <laughs> So the whole the whole thing we were getting away from now we're going back to mm -hmm. and, and then they're even doing some hybrid stuff where they're rendering it partially on the server and then it gets hydrated when it's brought in. And I, I don't know, man, I just look at it. I'm just like, wow, you know, you guys ended up somewhere kind of cool, but it seems like um, kind of a circuitous route, you know? Mm. Yeah. Everything that's old is new again. Right. <laughs> 
I mean, I, I, I used to use Make for building stuff in, in C and uh, C++. And, you know, I look at some of these new tools that are being used to build stuff. I'm like, oh, that's that's neat. You know, it's another Make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I've really come around to you mentioned Jamstack. Mm-hmm. I'm actually a really big, really big fan of that. Yeah, um, I think because it's the first letter in the Jamstack, the JavaScript aspect of it kind right. of gets overstated. People tend to think that it means like single page apps and all the things being rendered in JavaScript. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas for me, the kind of the pre rendered server side HTML, like just literally getting served flat HTML files is a big part of the appeal, right? Um, Jamstack sites can feel instantaneous in like a really kind of fascinating, fascinating way. Like I just, I, I am, especially because I spent the first part of my development career in the WordPress community, building WordPress sites on cheap shared hosting. Condolences. uh, You know, (laughs) so waiting for SQL queries to grab data and inject it into PHP templates and then churn it into HTML and send it back to the browser. Like that's a lot of time to a build process. And to go from that to you click a link and then the thing is just there. Right. Seemingly instantly is a really, um, really kind of cool experience. So the the funny thing is that I do a number of sites that are craft CMS sites. That's a PHP based CMS, but I run a fast CGI cache. Okay. And essentially what happens is the first request comes in, it runs the the PHP, it generates the page, and then it stores that as a flat HTML file that is then in the cache. Perfect. Then you hit the page again, guess what's returned? Just the HTML, nothing else, right? And mm-hmm. it's very similar to the way Varnish and uh, you know Fastly is kind of Varnish as a service. It's similar to the way that those work. I too really enjoy the appeal of just a flat HTML file that ends up getting returned. And it's funny that you bring that up because I'm actually doing a talk at a conference soon, which is kind of uh, Lamp Stack versus Jam Stack. Not in terms of like which one is better, but like the differences. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, like in both cases, you're doing the exact same thing. You really are, but you're doing them in different places. And in order to have that flat HTML file that is, can just be tossed on a CDN and, you know, just be served from there, you have to do the, the work that normally would be done on the server. You have to do it at build time, like using a tool like Gatsby or whatever it is that you use to build it. I I think that is, it is really nice. It is really nice, but there are downsides to that too, right? So let's let's say we've got a, a content author heavy site where they're used to being able to, you know, live preview the site to make sure that it's it's correct and has everything the way that it should be. And they're also used to that when they change something, it's instantly going to be up on the website. You know, I, I actually had one client that we we worked on a site and it, en- it ended up uh, being a, a build process that generated um, just HTML files that, that ended up getting deploying. And uh, their boss found a typo on a page. <laughs> mm-hmm. So they were told to go in there and change it. Well, they had to wait before it updated because I had to go through the whole build process, had to deploy everything, you know? And I guess my my only point in mentioning that is not that I think that this is bad, but just that there are trade-offs in in every way of working, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. That's interesting to me because my, um, I, you know, I use, I use Hugo, Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, it's a similar kind of thing, but I've always found like, I, I make my change, I push and like five seconds later, it's just, it's there. You're um, using a Git client to push. I uh, yeah. So I um yeah. You know, I'll just I'll work I'll work on my machine. Although right. you can you know you can use something like Forestry or right. some other sort of like CMS type integration. But right. Yeah. It um it hits GitHub. I have a webhook set up that automatically deploys it to my server and right. like runs a fresh build. And uh, well, it depends on how it's done, right? So that's true. Uh, yeah. so Gatsby, for instance, is if I love Gatsby. We've had um, the uh, some people from Gatsby on here a number of times. But when you change anything in Gatsby, it rebuilds the entire site and it redeploys the entire thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not it's not like it's going to take hours, but it doesn't happen as instantaneous as they are used to clicking a button in their in their old CMS. You know? Yeah, and that may be. Um I mean, Hugh, I'm continually blown away. One of the reasons I chose Hugo is because of how fast it compiles. Right. And like, I have my site is like, because I've been writing daily articles for a couple of years now. It's got like 2,000 or some odd pages on it that get compiled in, in about like three seconds. Right. It's pretty nuts how fast the whole thing works. Well, um, I'm not terribly surprised because it is, you know, it's written in Go. <laughs> and it's essentially what you're doing is you're, you're doing text parsing and then you're building stuff and away you go. 
you know? And I think Gatsby, Gatsby takes a little bit longer. To, first of all, they are working on incremental updates, which will solve this. They're also working on live preview as a service, which will alleviate a lot of client concerns. But the other thing is that Gatsby does a whole lot more than just, you know, parse markdown. It essentially has a GraphQL layer and it can accept data from all different sources, from GraphQL, from a REST API, from files on disk, from anywhere, literally. And then it normalizes the data sources and pulls those in and you can use those, but then it also will resize and optimize images. And it, it does a whole lot of best practices stuff for you generates a critical CSS, like it does all of this stuff, which is a lot more than just kind of parsing text and deploying it, you know? Yeah, I could, um, that does sound cool. Although, to be fair, Hugo has a, um, they do now, they didn't until, like, I forget actually when this got added, but it's a newer release, but they have a, like an Ajax method in there now, which is really cool. So mm -hmm. I used to have to do that sort of thing after the fact with JavaScript. And now I can make the call, get the data and do stuff with it as part of the build process, which is always really, um, really nice. And you can set how long those files cache for. So it's not making a fresh call every time it runs a build. It can, if you want to, but you know, I have mine set to like, you know, well, this, this would be interesting to get your take on it. So Gatsby is not just a static site generator. It's kind of like a, a best practices build tool kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But what you end up with is you end up with something that it goes through the whole process. It uses Webpack. It does critical CSS. It does image resizing and optimization. And you're, you are actually building a React app that ends up getting built and deployed with you know everything pre-rendered and all that kind of good stuff. What do you think about the idea of people using tools like this, where all of the underlying technologies, like a lot of people are like, ah, you know what? It's too much work to learn Webpack, to learn this, to learn that and the other thing. What do you think about something like Gatsby that kind of sits in, on top of that stuff? Or is it still too much? I am... Um Gatsby ends up spitting out at the end of the day. It's still like the end result is still for the most part, static HTML. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So I generally, and Adi Asmani, or not Adi Asmani, I'm sorry. Um, Jeremy Keith wrote about this a couple months ago, this article called The Split that was really interesting where he talked about like the, the front of the front end and the back of the front end. And this kind of falls into the back of the front end for me. Like I, I don't necessarily care. I don't really feel strongly about what, tools you use to build something if they work for you and it has no detriment to the user. Like I think frameworks in the browser have a detriment to the user that frameworks as backend templating tools that generate static HTML, like that has almost no impact on the user. Um, it just doesn't matter to them. Same thing with like using SAS to create your CSS. Like if you find it easier and you know, at the end of the day, the, the client is still getting CSS. But are we but, worried at all that there's then a, that we haven't gotten rid of all of those layers of complexity. We, we have built not. something, we built something on top of it to manage it for us. Do you have a problem with that? Yes. Well, no, but um, it does run the risk of gatekeeping depending on kind of how it's being used. Mm -hmm. team. You know, so like if you're just using it for yourself or using it with a small team and everybody kind of like is comfortable with it, no harm, no foul. I will say of all the static site generators, the ones I or the one I hear the most complaints about bugs and getting things set up with is Gatsby. It's also one of the newer kids on the block. Right. So, you know, I'm sure they're working through these things. If you really like kind of JavaScript templating, I also really strongly recommend, I don't use it, um, but I've played around with it, uh, Levendy from Zach Leatherman. Right. Um, mm -hmm. He released it right when I was making the jump over to static site generators. And it was just a little bit too feature light at the time for some of the stuff I needed to do. So I went with Hugo. Um, these days it is like a full featured static site generator. And uh, um, you know, if you're not, like one of the things with Gatsby, right, is you need to feel comfortable with React. So if you're not, but you want to do more JavaScript templating and still spit out static HTML, 11T might be a nice alternative for you. Now, I, I'll be perfectly honest. I haven't used 11T. I love a lot of the stuff that Zach does. So, um, Zach, I'm not bagging on you at all. But a lot of a lot of these <laughs> a lot of these static site builders that I've seen, mm -hmm. they're really good if you've got like a developer blog. And that's what you're spitting out. But they are not something that, for the most part, I can use to build a client site with. Is that is that something that you agree with or you think I'm full of it? I disagree. So I have, I think in and of themselves, like the thing that's usually missing from these tools is the CMS layer. Right. So for example, my wife and I adopted our last dog from this awesome organization called Pause New England. And I now 
volunteer with them and do their web stuff for them. Uh, I used to volunteer at a humane shelter. You're going to be bringing more home. Trust me. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, we've been trying to avoid it. <laughs> it's I, I know, but it's, it's going to happen. Really happen. But um, <laughs> so their newest iteration of their site, I've done a couple of sites from them now over the last like five or eight years, but their newest one is built on top of Hugo. Um, WordPress has started to get really laggy. That's what they were using before. Right. So now we use Hugo for their front end. And the back end is managed through forestry. So it still gives them that CMS layer. It's a lot more lightweight. So in some ways, it's actually easier for them to use than WordPress because there's less right. stuff there. And if we didn't have the need for like their donation page is handled by a different tech stack, just kind of nature of static site generators and kind of cost efficiency and not wanting to use a really expensive, like iframe driven kind of thing, you know, in another world, depending on what we were trying to do, I think something like Netlify, which includes a CMS option that you can heavily customize would have been a fantastic option for them. Yeah. Or Contentful or Dato CMI. There's there's so many options out there. I think for me, the only thing that's really missing from these tools for other, like for client use is the CMS. And I think there's a lot of options available right. for those. One of the things that they've really liked about it is just how much faster everything feels. Like all of the pages load so much faster. And I've built I've built not just sites, but I've built like full-on applications on top of these. So like when people buy my educational stuff, my JavaScript courses and things, they get access to a learning portal that is built with Hugo, a vanilla JavaScript front-end kind of UI rendering thing that, you know, some of the markup is pre-generated and then some of it is driven by JavaScript because you're only going to see the courses you've paid for and not everything. And then I have a headless WordPress instance that acts just as an API engine for me to grab some content and spit it back out in a like a JavaScript consumable fashion. So why um, why WordPress in this case? Because I am a front-end developer first. I know enough WordPress PHP to be dangerous. And it was the quickest way for me to <laughs> up and manage an authenticated API. If I had a better understanding of Node, I probably would have gone with like, right. you know, MongoDB and Express or something like that. But, you know, as a solo printer business owner guy, I went with I went with kind of the the fastest, easiest way for me to get this stood up, which I suppose is the argument for why a lot of people also use things like frameworks and other tools. That's exactly the argument that they use. <laughs> <laughs> Brings me full circle. So to to talk about that for just a minute. Yeah. I, I am of two minds about this. The first is when it, I, I keep hammering back on this, but it bothers me when it affects the user. Right. It doesn't bother me when it doesn't. So if you're using like Nuxt, you know, to run a framework on a server and spit out static HTML, I don't really care. I'm still getting like static HTML on the front end. And right. That's kind of how I feel a little bit with this like headless WordPress thing. It's just handling the API stuff. It infects the the end user of my thing in no way whatsoever. The other thing is if you're learning and you find these tools easier to grok or wrap your head around than just trying to work with native APIs. And I might argue that the articles you're reading are just not doing a great job ex- Planning native JavaScript to you. But like, let's just say I meet tons of people who f- like still use jQuery to learn because they find it easier to wrap their head around. Sure. I have absolutely no problem with that. I think learning, like when you're learning JavaScript, learning inertia, being able to go from I know nothing to I've built a thing that works and I'm excited about it is so much more important than doing things perfectly, doing things the exact right way. My bigger concern is when we use this stuff on like proper development projects and, you know, some funky little side project you're doing versus like a, a proper kind of project that lots of people are going to use or that, and then, you know, sometimes like things morph into those and you don't intend them to, but I just, I think, I think context matters and learners versus like paid developers working in an organization to do something, you know, is kind of a different use case and yada, yada, yada. I could kind of talk in circles about this for days, but. Um, well, I think what we're being asked to build, I think is, is definitely getting more complicated. And I think the, the number of technologies that are out there just, I mean, it's just, it, it's out of control really in terms of, you know, how much they're, they're growing and how the rate at which new things are, are introduced is, is pretty amazing. I do think that we do need some kind of, we do need some kind of tooling. Like that's one of the reasons I like Gatsby is that when you start out with Gatsby to build something, it's going to be built using best practices that you may not even be aware of. 
right? So it will automatically, the images on your site will automatically have a source set built for them. And it will be using that uh, appropriately in terms of how the, the image is displayed and will lazy load stuff below the fold. And it does all that kind of nice stuff for you that when so, if someone is new, it might seem daunting to where, speaking of gatekeeping, like complexity is gatekeeping, right? If it's too hard, if the, if the best practices just require way too much work to be able to do anything, that's gatekeeping right there. So I, I think that tools that kind of layer on top of that are a great entree kind of into that world. And then if you need to expand beyond that in terms of your learning, you can, you know? Mm -hmm. And Hugo sounds, I mean, I've never used Hugo to deploy a site, but I am very familiar with uh, with Jekyll and some other static site generators. So I get how they all work. And the, the simplicity that comes with those is very nice. And I totally get where you're coming from. And then it's really comforting that, you know, you've got your data over here, you run the build and whoop, there's the HTML, let's deploy it, you know? <laughs> Like it's very comforting, you know. It really is. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the templating is just like versus PHP and WordPress is just mm -hmm. so much easier too. Because right. at least it varies from you know generator to generator. But in Hugo, the templates are are HTML yep. files, which is really um, it's pleasing. And, and that is something that, like honestly, if I were asked to do. If my job morphed into doing WordPress development, like I probably just would do something else because it just doesn't interest me. <laughs> like it really doesn't. But that's one of the reasons why I like and use Craft CMS is that it has a really nice mix of flexibility in terms of you can build your information architecture however you want and also a nice templating language on the front end, which will, will give you, it, it allows you to build stuff from scratch in a really nice way. But, you know, I, I really have enjoyed, I, I feel like we could keep going. <laughs> Because there's a lot of stuff that we haven't covered, but um, we, unfortunately, have got to wrap things up for another episode of the devmode.fm podcast. Right. To have every episode delivered to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our RSS or subscribe via iTunes or Google Play. And if you like what we're doing, leave, leave us a review. You can follow us on Twitter at devmode.fm. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Please leave us a comment on the devmode.fm website. For the devmode.fm podcast, I'm Andrew Welch. And Chris, thank you for coming on. And I'm going to give you, I know I kind of like cut it short. So I'm going to, if you want to say anything, go ahead, get it in there. Go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for having me on. This was awesome. Um, anybody listening, if you want to kind of learn more about me or tell me how wrong I am, uh, head over to <laughs> gomakethings.com and uh, you can find all my stuff there. Don't, don't ever ask the internet to tell you how you're wrong. <laughs> oh, they'll do it anyways, but I like to give people the open invitation. <laughs>